toughest cases that I've uh, ever taken on has been over 200 aligners altogether. And, uh, you know, at that level, it, it stops to be, it stops being like fun. And <laughs> um, the, the kinds of things that really add up are things like really big, uh, say class two correction, where we're doing segmental distalization of molars. That's never One at fun. a time. That just, <laughs> it's not fun. And it, uh, it takes a lot of aligners and you're just asking for loss of tracking along the way as well. So uh, um, that and large transverse problems as well um, make me run into these big numbers. Now, um, aligners are all I do and, I, and I'm a specialist, so I tend to charge enough to be able to do well, even with the big uh, long cases. Uh, however, my, my message to uh, all of our friends uh, in this sphere is to, to just be careful about uh, those kinds of cases because um, yes, they're possible, maybe not quite so practical and for sure not profitable. Yes, right. yes, yes, absolutely. So gosh, a hundred, was it a hundred per arch or just kind right. of a so mix and two, match? 200 upper and lower aligners over a series of a number of, uh, of case refinements. And well, it's just after a while, it just do gets, you find like the patient gets like bored? Like, if you have braces, you're stuck wearing those suckers, they're not yes. coming off, right? But then <laughs> as time goes on, they kind of like lose motivation, they stop wearing the trays as much. So, do you have to stay more on top of patient monitoring at that point? Michelle, there's a real uh, uh, critical mass uh, beyond which even our best patients are starting to get tired of yeah. aligners. And I think that magic number is probably in around fi uh, 50 at the absolute max. So okay. uh, and beyond that, yes, you're going up the down escalator because <laughs> uh, patients sick of them, they, uh, they stop being as compliant as they were, uh, even with our best motivational techniques and our monitoring and our gung-ho speeches. Um, after a while, yes, yeah. there's, there's a limit. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, I am super excited to the to get to the content that you and I put together for everybody today. Um, full Contour just recently launched the, the Full Arch Treatment Planning. We've worked with Dr. Bruce for quite some time on preparing the protocols and what types of cases we were going to take on. And I had a ton of questions for him. And uh, so I'm excited to share with all of you guys what it is that we've got going on and what types of cases that you can now start to offer in your laboratory. So um, there is a chat button down in bottom. We want this to be fun and interactive. If you have a question, pop in the chat, put it in there. We'll try to answer them as we go, but we do have time set aside for Q&A at the end. Um, so that way you can ask all of your questions and let's go ahead and jump right in. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All righty. Perfect. Okay, so today we are going through the full arch uh, clear liner design offering, and this allows you to expand your offering to treat more patients, which is really exciting because previously you would have had to turn away these cases, which means you're losing that business to a competitor, which is obviously loss of revenue in your laboratory. So by treating more patients, you're able to expand um, and, and capture more of that revenue. So today's host, I'm Michelle Shippey. I've been with Full Contour for six years now. I uh, do customer development and I lead our orthodontic team. So that's everything from clear liner design to bracket removal, splints, night guards, model cleanup. Um, if it's in the ortho department, I'm involved in it and I absolutely love it. So much fun. And then Dr. Bruce, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your background? Well, thank you, Michelle. I am a Canadian. So uh... <laughs> Happy Canada Day out there, all of you. And I've uh, been an orthodontist for 29 years now and was really kind of early adopter in the aligner space. And, uh, and now two of my offices are exclusively aligners. And so I've got, gotten quite good at this and mostly by making almost every mistake possible. <laughs> so I'm here as a cautionary tale and uh, to, to help your customers be extremely successful in this space and there's lots of room for that. And yes. so I'm, I'm very excited for you and your customers, Michelle. 
Yeah, it's funny because, you know, the the aligner market is still growing so quickly. And originally it's like, you know, you have all these direct to consumer companies coming into the space. And so you see these big booms and they're coming in at cheaper prices. But also I think COVID played a big role because so many people now are working from home and they're staring at themselves on Zoom and Teams all day. And they're like, oh gosh, I need to fix that tooth or what exactly, <laughs> <laughs> right? And because they're more affordable, more people are able to, to jump in and, and do it. So I think it's still booming. There's still a huge opportunity. Um, so right now is the best time for labs to get started. So um, I'm going to briefly go through who Full Contour is, just in case anybody on this call isn't familiar. Full Contour is a design center. Uh, we have sites all around the globe um, from the US, Costa Rica, China, uh, Denmark, um, we've got three different design centers. We've got two customer support locations, so we can support you in multiple languages and time zones. Um, but all we do is design. We don't do any manufacturing of any physical products. So we would love to help you with a wide range of indications, everything from fixed crown and bridge, orthodontic designs, implant planning, removables. Basically, if it's a dental product, we want to be able to support you in your laboratory and designing it. But we're also more than just a design service. Obviously, we don't do the manufacturing, but we have a really unique platform that allows you to track your case statuses. Um, you can custom order, order different designs using our design guide and what we call modifiers. Um, you can connect with several different integrated manufacturers, which is really cool. So you can say, I want this clear liner case to go to this manufacturer, or I need this splint to go to this manufacturer. So we have lots of different manufacturing integrations, or you can produce the cases in-house. Um, we're integrated with a uh, dental system, uh, communicate, three shape communicate, treatment review. So there's a lot of different ways that you can interact with our platform. We have API integrations. Um, and then we also have our really slick doctor approval app, which makes uh, you sharing the cases with your treating doctors seamless and allows them to approve the cases and get them off to manufacturing uh, via a URL, which is really great. All right, so let's jump in. I'm so excited. So um, I've really been looking forward to this. It's been a long time coming. Um, people have been asking for years for the full arch clear liners. And um, so now we're, we're launching it and we're here to share it with you. So today we're gonna go over why you should offer full arch cases. What is the movement philosophy around um, how you treat full arch cases? Case selection, because that is key. And this is, we're gonna hammer this into your head. <laughs> and then we're gonna talk a little bit about auxiliary techniques, what those are and how they're used. And then setting expectations with your customers or the doctors. We're gonna talk a little bit about Dr. Bruce's I Can Do mentoring and then open it up for Q&A at the end. So let's jump in. So why offer full arch movement? And this is, <laughs> I learned this from Dr. Bruce. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, Isaac Newton. So <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. So one, you're going to be able to take on more cases, right? So the cases that you would have had to turn away in the past, you're now going to be able to accept those and uh, create additional revenue in your laboratory. You're going to end up with better overall outcomes. You can get to a much better smile at the end when you're moving all of the teeth in the mouth. And then, of course, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, which, Dr. Bruce, I'd love for you to speak to that for a minute. Okay, so Michelle, whether or not we've been moving back teeth, uh, there has been an effect on the back teeth, and it's because of this pesky Newton guy. So <laughs> All even, <his> fault. <laughs> you know, we, we, along the way, of course, we've been careful at first to, to select cases that maybe only have trouble in the front teeth, but you're asking the back teeth to act as the equal and opposites. So uh, Newton, uh, it's a law. You cannot get around it. <laughs> Darn him. <laughs> His third law, yes. <laughs> yes, we've tried, believe me. Uh, so th the answer is, even if you're just moving front teeth, you're going to affect the back teeth. And so it, it really makes a great deal of logical sense to me, even if we're sticking to rather uh, straightforward cases, uh, to have control and be purposeful about what's happening in the posterior teeth, uh, whether or not we're moving them a great deal because of the effect that we're gonna have um, on, on the back teeth, even from just moving front teeth. So that was the messaging from here. Yes, absolutely. And so one of the biggest complaints that you see on a lot of these D to C style cases is you see complaints of posterior open bite. And my question to Dr. Bruce was, well, why is that? Why is it that when you're only moving anterior teeth, you end up with a posterior open bite? So maybe you could speak to that for a second. Absolutely, Michelle. So the, the, the issue is that 
If, um, those of you that do some orthodontics are aware of a bite plane effect. So if you put two layers of plastic between the back teeth, uh, right away, you have introduced a bite plane effect. And of course, the bite plane effect will be with occlusal forces, uh, intrusion of posterior teeth. And you can't be that as equal in your intrusion in the front teeth. So therefore, uh, there is this net uh, opening in the, in the posterior and once you've got it, it's really hard to fix unless you're actually engaging the back teeth as well. The other thing that happens is there's this rotation of the occlusal plane that occurs also due to that bite plane effect with the, the maxillary teeth going up more than the mandibular teeth going down. And therefore, uh, once again, that contributes to posterior open bite. And there's nothing worse. The patient will be driven crazy by this you will introduce new things in their mouth that they've never had to deal with before and possibly long-term cause some damage. And I think this is the ultimate uh, big issue with direct-to-consumer orthodontic providers because they are not going to be able to react to that and understand that. So uh, with, with Michelle and a Full Contour, they, they do get that and we're gonna help you. And the key is over-engineering that so that we don't deal with posterior open bites on all these cases. Okay. All right, so jump into the next screen here. So let's jump right into the movement details, right? And the protocol details. So full contour, and this is specific to full contour in our design offering. So molar movement generally refers to the 3D positioning of the upper and lower first molars. Second molars can be addressed when necessary, but to a lesser extent. So let's pause here for a moment. Why? <laughs> okay, so if you remember, when you're a kid, if you were on the ice, uh, Canadians, once again, sorry. I live in Arizona, <laughs> Dr. Bruce. <laughs> what is ice? <laughs> and you were skating and you were all linked together to all of your friends, but you were the last person in the line. You were gonna be whipped around like crazy and the person closer to the front will, would not be. So the, the, the issue is we don't have a, a, enough, as much control over a, a last tooth in the, in the arch uh, than, than a tooth in the middle because we can use the two neighboring teeth as anchors against which to do whatever we wanna do. So yes, we can include second molars. Yes, we can do things like torque them and position them buccolingually, but not as well as we can with first molars. That was a genius analogy, love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then third molars are not to be included in most cases. And most people aren't going to have their third molars. Um, and if they are, they're so far back there that you're not going to, most of the time molars need attachments and placing an attachment way back there is just not going to yes. happen. So. <laughs> And then upper molars have more movement possibilities than lower molars due to differences in anatomy in the maxilla and uh, mandible. So um, what, what exactly does that mean? Let's explain that. So the maxilla is quite a, a different bony structure in which there is a lot of uh, cantellus bone and then uh, wide uh, alveolar ridges and um, cortical bone on either side. The mandible, much narrower, much more robust cortical plates and much less sort of runway in between the cortical plates for those uh, lower molars to actually move. So we, we actually resist moving them a great deal buccolingually. It's more like uprighting them. And so that there's much less sort of latitude available to us in the mandible. And therefore we tend to set up the mandible it, the best we can, and then use the flexibility of the maxilla to, uh, to kind of uh, reset the bite. Um, with, with more movement in the upper than on the lower. Okay, perfect. And then you already addressed this, but lower molars generally can't be expanded, mo uh, mainly uprighted, so right perfect. All right, additional details here. So some movements are less predictable and auxiliary techniques will be advised. We will go into uh, a little bit more detail on what are auxiliary techniques and how they're utilized in just a few slides. There are limitations to molar movements that are case specific and can be uh, related to the crown and root morphology, bone quantity and quality, age, health status and compliance. I mean, it's it's almost the same with anteriors though, right? Because their perio status matters, their age matters. Um, we often get asked, well, can you treat uh, like, I think Invisalign calls it stage one where it's the kiddos uh, who still have some primary teeth and, Sure, you could treat them, but your approach is different. And then also 
as their teeth are growing in, you have to do a lot more mid-course corrections, more trays, things like that. So we, we just don't treat them um, because we don't do any manufacturing. And at the lab, that would just get way too pricey. Uh, it doesn't make sense. So, but the same thing goes for full arch cases. You, because you're moving all the teeth and because molars are so difficult, um, and typically, when uh, um, a GP or an orthodontist is looking at a full arch case, they tend to be a little bit more complex cases. And so we have to be really careful about how we're moving those teeth and what we're doing for the patient. So I would highly, highly recommend laboratories. If you're going to take on full arch cases, ask for an x-ray. I think it's very wise. Mm -hmm. And yep. then full posterior crossbite cases may not be treatable. We might have to leave those teeth in an edge-to-edge -edge crossbite, um, depending on the severity. So, Dr. Bruce, let's speak to that a little bit. Why can't we do a full crossbite correction? Um, quite often, they are like skeletal crossbites, Michelle, meaning that it's not just the teeth that are in crossbite. It's actually the bones that are at fault. And if the patient's beyond a certain age, it's really difficult to make, say, the maxilla wider to get them out of a crossbite. So what we'll sometimes do is put them into a really good crossbite, as in uh, the, <laughs> the buccal cusp of the upper uh, molar right in the middle uh, fossa of the lower molar. Uh, that's actually preferable to something where they hit on inclined planes. Sure. So it's either, yes, edge to edge, we'll correct it, or no, nope, full crossbite, let's just make the most of it and not okay. uh, try and over overcorrect it. Perfect. So in those types of cases, and we've seen them, right, the, the case gets to, submitted to full contour, it might be a little bit of just a, a back and forth conversation with the treating doctor of what's possible. Um, and also making sure that if they're wanting a full crossbite correction, we, we set realistic expectations. <laughs> And then we are not offering sequential molar distillation. So Dr. Bruce, those 200 stage cases, we don't want them. Don't send them to full contour. <laughs> right, right. right. So, so. Uh, yeah. so certain of the manufacturers, of course, provide us with kind of an infinite number of, uh, of clear aligners for a given cost. Um, and so we really, for that, it sometimes is reasonable in that scenario. But uh, for what we're up to, you and I, Michelle, we really want to stick to these cases that don't ask for that. For the reason stated, they just take so many aligners and you're really asking for lack of, uh, of good tracking. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of laboratories work with uh, GPs, right? And it really takes an in-depth orthodontic knowledge to take on some of these severe cases. And you don't want to get to a point where the GP is calling the lab saying, I messed up the patient's bite. What do I do? How do I fix this? Right. And then you at the lab say, I don't know. We just, we just started offering clear liners. I'm not really sure what to do. Right. So we want to be looking for those mild to moderate full arch cases, not those crazy severe cases. Um, sequential molar distillation, if you're not familiar, it's just moving the teeth either one at a time or two at a time. And you just kind of like work your way backwards. It takes a really long time to design those cases. It adds way more trays. It just makes things less predictable and more challenging. And so that is not something that Full Contour can offer. Right on. Uh, the answer though, Michelle, to your original scenario is send the case to Dr. Bruce and he'll get yes. the person out of it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And we'll see how in a moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you guys get in any pickles at all, just pick up the phone and call Dr. Oh Bruce. Yes. <laughs> Preferably so... email because they don't really answer my Fair. phone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Okay. So I just want to go through um, attachment specifics, right? Because molars are more challenging to move. Um, they're stubborn fellows, right? And so we have to add attachments more frequently than we do with anterior teeth. So for example, um, typically on, a, on an anterior tooth, we would place an attachment when the tooth has to be rotated more than 28 degrees, where with molars, it's at 15 degrees. Anything above that needs, needs an attachment. So I won't go through all of these. We just wanted to highlight here that um, you're going to see attachments more frequently on full arch cases than you would just anterior movement. Also, elastics are not to be intended for this protocol. Elastics are auxiliary techniques. And again, I promise we'll get to that, but full contour cannot offer elastic cutouts. That's not to say if you have a, a dentist or an orthodontist who knows their stuff and knows how to use elastics, deliver them the aligners and they can cut them out and incorporate the elastics themselves. That's totally doable. It's just full, con full contour can't mark on the model where to do the elastic cutouts. All right. So 
getting into treatable and not treatable. So what is treatable? We, we talked about mild to moderate cases. So we're, it's the same thing as the anterior teeth, only we're doing the whole arch. So mild to moderate spacing, mild to moderate crowding, improving the cusp fossa relationship, right? So again, not the full crossbite cases. We can't, we can't correct those fully. Class one correction, possibly class two, depending on how bad it is. Um, extraction cases, open bites, deep bites, and then anterior or posterior crossbite with an asterisk that it's a maybe. <laughs> it depends <laughs> on the severity. Right on. So Michelle, some of them, uh, when we say mild class two, a lot of them look class two in the molars, mainly because the upper molars are mesially rotated. And with a nice attachment on those teeth, that's actually a really good move for us to do. And we can make the case into a class one and also create a bunch more space by derotating that molar. So we're not necessarily saying absolutely not to anything that looks class two, but keep them on the mild side. Yes, and if you're not sure if it's treatable, you can still submit it to full contour. If we don't feel like it fits into our protocols, we would just put the case on hold and say, we don't feel comfortable treating this and you don't get billed for the design because we didn't do the design. I've also had scenarios where we said, we don't feel comfortable treating this and the treating doctor who's ultimately responsible for that case came back and said, just bring the case to the maximum movements that you can do. We'll get the patient to that point, we'll rescan and we'll do another treatment and we'll kind of go down that road until I feel like I've had a good position. So again, it's a little bit of a give and take. Um, however, if you get the case at the lab and you're just not sure, feel free to submit it and we'll evaluate and make sure that we can treat that patient. Awesome. So what's not treatable? Full posterior crossbite, a class three bite. We can't change bites. So the 3D viewer, um, if the patient had a posterior open bite and we were to set the bite in the three shape software, you're not going to see that translate into the 3D viewer. It doesn't show any articulation. So sure, we could potentially treat an open bite issue in the posterior, but you won't see that in reality in the 3D viewer. Now, like I've had a couple of cases with you, Dr. Bruce, where that was the case, but because you're as experienced as you are, you know when certain interferences are removed or the teeth reach a certain position, the bite's going to close. There's nothing there to keep mm -hmm. it open. Right on. Uh, and a great example of that, Michelle, is one of these sort of pseudo class threes where they're, the true bite is, is edge to edge but the person has to push their mandible forward just to get their back teeth together. So that one is actually a, a fair one for us to take on. And that is just by jumping the bite, uh, then you actually uncover the truth, which is actually that patient's kind of class one, but they have a functional shift and we can identify those for you. Absolutely. Oh, I jumped ahead a little bit. So, um, so just the whole list here, severe deep bite, skeletal open bite, midline discrepancy over two millimeters. And these are all the same as the anterior cases, right? Mm -hmm. So just because we're moving the molars doesn't mean we're going to suddenly be able to close a four millimeter space, right? So we have to be careful about what types of cases we take on. So again, we're looking for those mild to moderate cases, preparation for veneers, implant placement, other dental restorations, molar uprighting. Um, those are going to be your, your bread and butter cases, getting excited and moving ahead here. <laughs> so I just wanted to show some pictures, right? Because I think for me, I'm a visual learner. So when I see something, I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So this is a crossbite case, right? So we see this tooth here is in crossbite, but it's just one tooth and it's not a severe crossbite. We can very easily uh, get that tooth into position. On the other side, you have this bilateral crossbite. Dr. Bruce, let's talk a little bit about what would it take for an orthodontist to treat a patient like this? So uh, a lot of this would depend on the age of this patient. It looks like this patient's older with the, the loss of gingival attachment and that sort of thing that has gone along with it. Uh, a lot of these we do surgically, Michelle, as in either a surgical assisted maxillar expansion or uh, actual Lafort osteotomy where we basically take their maxilla apart and uh, put it back together. That sounds uh, it, awful. <laughs> it is quite a big deal, actually. Thank you. <laughs> the surgeon literally holds your maxilla in, oh in his gosh. or her hand and then repositions it. Uh, certain of these we can do with some of our new technology, which include uh, heat activated expanders where they're, they're titanium and they actually take and uh, they're activated by the heat of the mouth hmm. and uh, they make the, uh, the maxilla wider. But th in this particular case, we would analyze this as a true skeletal bilateral crossbite. And we would be in, uh, you know, some of it is that the, 
the upper molars lack torque, but even torquing those teeth isn't going to get you out of that crossbite. It may actually worsen the situation a little bit. Uh, a lot of these crossbites, if they've been there for a long time, they're fairly stable, meaning that you know the, the patient's musculature has adapted to them. Um, and by trying to correct them, you're actually putting in an imbalance. So most of these are surgical cases. Got it. Yeah. And even if like it's not um, a bilateral crossbite, even an, an arch that just one side is in crossbite, it's still really difficult to treat. Yes. Yes. Um, even with auxiliary techniques, right? So Indeed. that's where you get like, arch expanders involved. And again, full contour can't offer any of that. So the case on the well, right would not be treatable. <laughs> got it. So when, one thing we do a lot of is, is we'll ask for one arch treatment, like say to you, Michelle, please just line up the lower teeth. We're going to take care of the upper with some other technique. And then once I get the width, however it's gotten, either with an expander or surgical then once again, I would rescan that patient and send it back as a new case to you. And, and there, from that, excuse me, from that point, uh, much more finishable. Perfect. All right, so the next one is uh, class one and class two, class three, right? So we said class one, definitely treatable, no, no big deal. Class two, maybe, just depends, right? And then class three, we just, we can't treat. Um, obviously, if it's like an edge to edge bite, we're, we're okay to treat that. I did want to put like a, just a picture here of the class one, class two, and class three, just so you got a visualization of uh, the molar relationship and how those differed. Um, so again, class one and class two, most part we can, we can treat. I, um, before we move on, why is class three so difficult to treat? Well, uh, with the class three bite, a, a lot of them are really skeletal, as in, you know, if we took, took a cephalometric scan of that patient and did our measurements, we'd realize that it's a true skeletal mismatch as opposed to just, you know, a, a jaw that's a little bit behind or ahead. So uh, they're, they're considerably more difficult. They're actually quite a bit more rare, which is... Uh, a good thing, uh, only about 5% of our population has a true class three uh, malocclusion. Class two, considerably more prevalent. And of course, class ones are our absolute bread and butter for this system. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Uh, and then mild and severe deep bites, right? And and for somebody who's new into clear liners, you might look at the photo on the right and go, oh, well, that doesn't seem so difficult, right? Just intrude some teeth and you got a pretty smile. So mild deep bites, yes, we can treat those. Severe deep bites, let's talk a little bit about why we want to avoid those. Okay, so Michelle, we're fighting against that thing that I described where you've got two layers of plastic at the back already. That, that makes it want to go deeper, right? Because you're intruding yep. the posterior teeth. So already you're fighting against that. The second thing is these teeth, a lot of them, especially over time, have, uh, have over erupted. And actual true straight on intrusion of teeth is possible, but only to a certain degree. So what we count on is a, a little bit of intrusion and a, and a lot of what we call relative intrusion, uh, uh, which, which actually means extrusion of the posterior teeth to open up the bite. And that uh, requires a lot of extra work, time, and some pretty sophisticated attachment systems as well. And I think uh, we're going to get there. But for now, we would encourage our customers to really kind of stay in the mild to moderate range uh, for much more success and health and wealth. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> mild open bite compared to skeletal open bite. And I think, I mean, we, we kind of hammered home that skeletal issues are not to be fixed with just clear liners. They can't be, right? So we're talking surg surgery or other attachment devices, right? To help uh, close the open bite. So, but a mild open bite, pretty easy. Uh, it, again, it just depends on the severity. So if you're not sure, submit the case and we'll let you know if we, we can treat it or not. Absolutely. All right, let's jump into auxiliary techniques. So what are they? So the purpose of auxiliary techniques is to enhance the efficacy of the orthodontic tooth movement and overcome some of the limitations of clear liners. So 
plastic can only do so much, which is why braces are so successful because they are fixed and there's a lot of pressure there, right? And there's wires that are moving the teeth and holding the teeth in place. Plastic over time relaxes and you're not getting, most of the tooth movement happens in the first 24 to 48 hours. And then they wear that tray for the two weeks, right? Yeah. So the auxiliary techniques are additional things that the dentist or orthodontist can do to get the teeth to move because <laughs> those challenging cases like the crossbite, the arch expansion um, can't be done with just plastic alone. So Dr. Bruce, let's, let's talk through each of these. Um, I think most people are familiar with the buttons and the elastics. Um, so that's, it's just like regular braces. You've got your rubber band. Doctor just would punch out a hole in, in the plastic and put the button on. And then uh, the patient would wear the rubber bands throughout the day. And that would help with the tooth movement. Right on, Michelle, you've described it perfectly. And uh, so this is just to, to kind of uh, take what's dialed into the aligners and kind of turbo charge it uh, and put it in the right direction. So say we do have a mild class two, then the class two elastics will help. And definitely on these class threes, especially those pseudo ones, an elastic jump will absolutely help us get that, that bite jump. So uh, um, we would absolutely encourage our dentists to give this sort of thing a go because they do widen the scope that they can uh, take on. But once again, we're asking them, you know, don't do these and don't do these. Yep. Uh, but the, the ones that are sort of in between and might be helped with a little bit of elastic, then absolutely. We actually use a single hole punch in our office. It works so well, like <laughs> from Staples. Uh, and uh, it's uh, so inexpensive and, and useful. And it, it just pops them out and we put little uh, on the um, back teeth, we generally use a hook. And on the uh, anterior tooth, we'll use like a little a porcelain button. Perfect. And yeah, works great. And then the next one is the high frequency vibration. So this is just something the patient puts in their mouth and they bite on it. I think it's like five minutes a day. And that vibration helps to break down the bone during the treatment and then helps to build the bone back. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why that would be useful and how they're seeing success with that. Right on. So Michelle, there's some good science behind both of these devices, actually. And the, 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 the picture shows a V-Pro device from Propel. And uh, what we've been finding is, you know, if we put so much care and effort into designing these devices, but they'll only be as good as how well they seat. Yes. And so the vibration seems to really do a nice job with getting those aligners all the way up and into our undercuts of the teeth and doing their job and, and also engaging the attachments that we've put onto the teeth. And yes, like you said, it increases blood flow to the area and stimulates those cells that we like so much, like our osteoclasts and osteoblasts. Uh, so that we use a lot of, and uh, especially once again, if we're sort of paying for each aligner, we want each aligner to give us the absolute most that has been dialed yes. into it so carefully by full contour. So we really want them to fully, fully see. Perfect. And then micro osteoperforation, such a big word, <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, I'll let you describe this because let's be honest, I've never performed this, so okay. go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Sure. It's, it's fun. Uh, so, uh, it doesn't look fun. Let me tell you, okay. right? Vacation, I would be like, can I just take the vibration device, please? Okay. <laughs> uh, so it's literally little holes in the bone. And uh, what it, we, we, the way we describe it to our patients is we're softening the bone, therefore making the environment into which we're moving these teeth uh, much more amenable to uh, reacting to the forces that are provided by the clear aligners. Uh, and it sounds weird, but we actually do put a lot of holes in people's uh, alveolar bone, and it does temporarily soften the bone, and it causes this cascade of cellular activity that increases the uh, velocity of tooth movement. I generally use it mostly for getting out of trouble, because I, I get into trouble a lot. So, <laughs> you, <laughs> um, Dr. Bruce! <laughs> I know, you think you know by now, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, so... Quite often, you know, we, everything's going great. And then one tooth just, ah, oh, it just simply will not move. We'll perforate around that tooth. And all of a sudden uh, the bone starts being reactive and the tooth starts moving. So it basically saves that particular case. Um, and uh, the dentist can charge for this too. It's called an alveoplasty in the fee guide. And uh, we encourage them to do so. Where I come from, it's around $200 
a sextant for the dentist to perform this. And it takes a lot of cases from sort of okay to out of the park. That's amazing. Very cool. Okay. So the reason I wanted to share this is sometimes a, a full contour designer will put a note on our document, our treatment document that says auxiliary techniques are recommended or required. We don't care what auxiliary technique the doctor chooses. We're just letting the treating doctor know that they need to do something. Otherwise, this treatment plan will be unpredictable in the sense that like those teeth aren't going to move how the software plan them to move because teeth it's predicting how teeth will move, but there's a lot of factors that go into tooth movement, right? Such as age, uh, compliance, all those things. And sometimes you do everything right and the teeth still don't move the way you planned it. It's, it's a scientific guess, right? Um, so when we say auxiliary techniques are required, it's up to the doctor's discretion as to what they want to use. And there's, a, there's more options than this, I'm sure. Um, but these are kind of like the main tools. Am I, am I right in yeah. that statement? Yeah, the one that we use a lot of also is derotation. So we'll put a couple of buttons on a on teeth next to uh, uh, teeth that are quite rotated, and then use just little chain elastics like a, a power chain. Yep. And uh, that really helps the aligners to turn teeth because as you saw from our protocols, um, anything over about 15 degrees is hard for the aligners, especially in a cylindrical tooth, like a lower premolar. So instead, we go back to Newton again and use moments and couples with our uh, lingual and buccal um, movements working against each other to derotate those teeth. Once again, that's done with cutouts and buttons. Perfect. All right. So setting expectations, right? Because we just went through all of this and you get to your lab and you're like, I'm ready to expand my offering. I want to roll this out to my doctors. And you, you call them and you say, hey, we're, we're offering full arch treatment planning now. A lot of dentists and orthodontists are going to go to like those difficult 200 stage cases and they're like, yes, because they know that they can save money with using your laboratory instead of some of these big players out there. Um, but you want to set very clear expectations so that you don't get yourself into trouble and you don't end up with a frustrated customer. So one, it's still mild to moderate tooth movement. It's cases that are typically 30 stages or less per arch. So we're really... We're just doing some expansion, derotation, some tipping or torquing, um, not torquing. <laughs> so they're just the, <laughs> had to just throw that in there. Um, so there's still those uh, fairly simple cases. Although we've seen some, we can take on some challenging cases. I don't want to discourage you guys. It's still, you can still take complex cases. It's just not going to be those severe cases. Um, posterior teeth are more challenging to move. More refinements are required or should be expected. Auxiliary techniques will be required for challenging movements. So you'll see that notated on the PDF document. And then attachments are needed more frequently. So you're going to see those more often. Um, and ooh, I jumped ahead, but that's kind of setting the expectation, right? We're just being very clear up front that, listen, we're just expanding our offering a little bit to move the molars, but the types of cases that we're taking on are still the same. So need help? We've got this wonderful gentleman on the call today, Dr. Bruce. He's very knowledgeable. Um, so Dr. Bruce, let's, let's talk through what is I can do? What's your mentoring service all about? All right. So, you know, I, I have this mission in life <laughs> to uh, make everybody successful. And it, it's a little bit different because a lot of orthodontists don't want, you know, general dentists doing a whole lot of orthodontics. But uh, to me, that's like an endodontist saying, don't do, you know, single canal anterior root canals. Of course, he wouldn't, he or she wouldn't say that. But, you know, the the uh, third molar with the broken file, you might send that to the endodontist, right? So the same thing with ortho. And there's so much room out there, Michelle, as we've yes. discussed. And uh, with careful case selection, um, we can be really, really successful and make our customers and our patients extremely happy, keep them uh, loving us and, uh, and, and, be, and be profitable as well. And so uh, part of the messaging is, you know, let me help you, especially with case selection. And then of course, execution. And finally with troubleshooting, uh, because I've made every mistake possible as I mentioned. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I can do as an acronym uh, for improvement, constant and never ending for dentists and orthodontics. It's a Canadian company. So it's I can do.ca and an email to info at I can do.ca will get you to a lady named Carla who simply won't let me go home. <laughs> <until I'm done. laughs> 
answer your in interesting questions. Yes. Uh, so uh, we have online education there for, uh, for dentists and, and uh, providers such as laboratories. And also I will help you on a case by case basis, uh, especially for the new labs that are, you're just becoming your partners now, Michelle, if they kind of don't know where to start or, or just, uh, you know, want to find a niche that might really work in their particular marketplace. Uh, I've seen it all and I would absolutely be willing and able to help them out. And then uh, if you do engage uh, me, I will be the angel on the shoulder of the practitioner that is uh, executing this case and will be with them all the way and make sure they get to a, a nice finish in the right amount of time. Yes, I love that. So I was talking with Dr. Bruce, uh, you know, about the struggle that I see with laboratories who are starting to offer clear aligners and they might be a crown and bridge lab that have no ortho background or they have a person in the lab who knows a little bit about ortho, but they have to come up with this whole offering, right? And they have to say, okay, what? how are we gonna build the dentist? What's a mid-course correction? What are attachments? How do you do IPR, right? There's so many different questions out there that these labs have and they, they just need a little bit of support to start walking and then running, right? And so I, I came to Dr. Bruce and I said, let's put together some education programs for full contour customers because we see this need there. Um, and Dr. Bruce is the perfect person to come with his education and, and he, you're so willing to share it and I love that. So thank you. the first uh, program that we wanted to, to talk to you guys about is the doctor education program. So this would be you hosting a webinar with Dr. Bruce to educate your doctors on your aligner offering. So you and Dr. Bruce would work together to brand a, a PowerPoint presentation with your lab's aligner brand, but you would just have Dr. Bruce there to talk through the clinical offering, um, just like we did today on what's treatable, what's not treatable, answer their technical questions. Um, you're there to promote your aligner brand with confidence. It gives the, the treating doctors, your clients, uh, confidence in your aligner brand that why should they send to you? Well, you guys know what you're doing and what you're talking about. Um, and then it can also be an educational session for clinicians who are new to clear aligners. There's a lot of them out there and they're asking the same questions. What tools should I use for IPR? How do you perform IPR? How do I get the attachments to stick? Uh, how do I monitor the patients for success? You know, And so Dr. Bruce can share all of his years of experience um, doing everything with just clear aligners and can really help you promote your brand as a, a successful offering in the marketplace. And then mm -hmm. of course, Q and A sessions, right? At the end, you can open it up and your clinicians can ask away. So that's the doctor education program. And then the lab education program is gonna be one-on-one -on -one training for you and your staff with Dr. Bruce. So this is your time to pick his brain, write all of your questions down, get it all out there. It helps your staff to gain confidence on offering clear liners in your laboratory. And then you get that time, that one-on-one -on -one time with him to answer all of your questions. Um, so those are the two different programs that we have for you guys. And it's only $350 an hour for full contour customers. I would say you should typically expect, depending on which one you pick, say you do the doctor education program, probably two hours of Dr. Bruce's time, an hour to do content creation and just align on what you're gonna cover, and then an hour for the webinar. Um, for lab education, you might only need 30 minutes or an hour of his time to ask your questions and, and get some advice. So um, we are going to put in the chat a link. So if you're interested in either doctor or lab education, Click on the link, Liz will put that there for you guys and you can just fill in your lab info and how he can reach out to you. And then I'm sure Carla will reach out and get you guys <laughs> scheduled for either of those options. So definitely you guys take advantage of this because it is definitely needed out there. Um, and Dr. Bruce is the guy to do it, so. Uh, thank you, Michelle, that's great. Yeah, and you would have my heart and soul. Uh, absolutely, I'm, I'm uh, very interested in uh, making people be successful and happy and healthy in this space. So thank you guys. We do want to open it up for Q&A, uh, make sure that we can answer all of the questions that you guys have. So make sure that you 
put your questions in the chat, um, or I guess there's a Q&A area too, either one. So um, somebody said, great webinar. I'm curious to know if there's a plan to improve the 3D viewer on the full contour of portal. I feel like the 3D model is stuck in the middle of the screen. And it's hard to visualize the lower jaw movements. Yes, that is a great question. I love that. So we are, I'm so glad you asked. We're literally in the middle of development right now. So we are completely rebuilding our doctor approval app from the ground up. Um, we've gotten Dr. Bruce's feedback and advice. Um, and we've also asked uh, our key opinion leaders all over the globe over the last three years. We've accumulated a ton of feedback on what people like or don't like or what features are valuable to them. And we took that all to the full contour development team and they are implementing as we speak. So um, I would anticipate sometime in August, my development team is going to be so mad at me that I committed to that, but I'm hoping sometime in August that you will see those new tools available. Um, and in regards to 3D viewer being stuck in the middle of the screen, 3D technology is very challenging. And so what's interesting, and I'm going to try to repeat this the way that our developer explained it to me, and I'm, I don't do development, so... If I say something wrong, I apologize. But when you're looking at the 3D object, it's basically the camera that you're looking at is moving around the object. It's not the object itself that is moving. So that's why it can be difficult when you turn on only one arch to get it to rotate in the direction that you want it to go because it's the camera that's moving, not the 3D object. So there is some new technology out there that we're trying to implement that would just make the rotation of the models much more seamless and also um, much more lifelike instead of, uh, unnatural coloring. So that is coming soon. I'm really excited about that. Any other questions? I know I had some questions for Dr. Bruce um, that I wanted to just ask because I've been asked lots of times and I think it would be valuable for other people to hear this. So um, first question for you is, what uh, are the few main reasons a dentist or an orthodontist would go looking for a new aligner solution outside of the main big guys in the market, right? What value propositions do the laboratories have or should they promote? Well, I think, I think Michelle, in general, there is money to be saved. Uh, and part of it is, unless you're super elevated with some of these big guys, uh, they're, they're, uh, <laughs> they're not the best deals, especially for the kinds of cases that you and I have been uh, talking about. And so uh, I, would, I, I love working with Full Contour because their, their, their culture is such that, that, that they're your partner, not just kind of a... Uh, designer. And uh, for those reasons, also, especially if you're a neophyte, the uh, full contour will be a lot more sort of supportive of you than just a, a big guy that that only really wants you to submit more cases. So uh, that is that, that that's been the reason why I've been seeking out from my own offices, um, a, a solution outside of, of some of the bigger players. Um, and it does give you more flexibility as well as to whether or not you want to be all of the above, as in uh, you want to follow through the design and be your own manufacturer, which, a lot, which some people do, uh, or choose your own manufacturer. Uh, and it could be based on the, your favorite lab as well that you've already got such a great relationship with. Um, and now they're starting to offer clear aligners as well. It's kind of like all in the same family. And yeah. uh, I really dig that. Yeah, awesome. And then what do you see happening in the market? Are more dentists and orthodontists switching and offering an in-house, maybe a custom branded aligner versus the name brands that we're all aware of? Kind of what what shifts do you see happening? Indeed, I, I do see that, Michelle. Uh, I, I do see it falling short, though, of the dentist becoming everything, meaning the the dentist doing all of the design and all of their own manufacturing, because it takes, as the labs can tell you, it's so much and uh, yes. uh, learning technology and uh, even like 3D printing and that sort of thing. It's, it's yeah. just quite involved. So I see uh, a, a little bit of that coming more in house with the practitioner, however, still partnering uh, with a designer and with a manufacturer. And along the way, uh, manufacturers, if you can also uh, make them sound like they're my aligners, like Mick aligners or something like that, <laughs> uh, that, that would be a, a win-win for everybody. And uh, there's this, this so much room out there. I think I saw a, a stat, Michelle, that like 3% right now of malocclusions in the United States are actually in treatment. So there's, and there's like mind blowing. So 65% of Americans would say to you, there's something about their tooth alignment they just don't like. So, yeah. 
And, and then of course, working with a full service lab, the other advantage is for cases that are bound to be cosmetic cases or, or prosthetic cases, that is like a double win because the, the same people that are, you know, uprighting the teeth to provide the space for the implant are the ones that are going to make the implant as well. Yeah. And for me, that's like magic because I'm always back and forth with people that are doing the implants or, or going to widen the peg laterals. Where do you want these? What, how do you want this to look? Uh, so, but if you're working with a full service lab, all of that, you've already got the end in mind and that makes the journey uh, much better. Perfect. Yeah. And I, you know, it's interesting because using full contour as a design partner, it really allows for this flexibility, as you mentioned, like I might want to make this small refinement case in-house. Like if I'm a, a dentist, right, I might buy a, a form labs or something, right. And I'm going to make this three stage refinement case in-house to save myself a ton of money, but I'm not going to want to print a 40 stage case on my form labs that would take you like forever. So then that's where they have this flexibility to save money where they can, they can outsource to their favorite laboratory that they're comfortable and they worked with for years, or maybe for those really complex cases, they use those big players that they're aware of, but it just creates this really nice flexibility for them. And then also being able to have like a white or private label aligner, um, that's huge because then they can also uh, compete with those direct to consumer prices with still doctor led treatment. Um, and so it, it allows them to capture a market that they would have lost to um, a cheaper company um, if they only had one aligner offering in, in house. So very cool. Okay. Really? So let's talk about, um, we talked a lot about auxiliary techniques, right? So I'm just curious, what's your favorite auxiliary okay. technique <laughs> and why? <laughs> uh, so in general, I, I look at situations where I just know the aligners aren't going to all by themselves, aren't going to do, do it. So the vast majority of my uh, auxiliary devices are fixed devices, such as buttons, uh, expanders, and sometimes even things like uh, class two or class three correctors before we actually get into the alignment of the teeth. If you can get the, the jaws matched up and then the fit of the teeth is, is a home run after that. So those are the kinds of things that we do either before, during, and maybe sometimes after uh, clear aligners just to make uh, them much more successful end up using fewer aligners as well, which is- uh, Always a win. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about fit issues because that is one of the main complaints that you get with clear aligners, right? You go through this whole process of you get the impression, you do the treatment planning, goes to manufacturing, patients five trays in and uh, the next tray is not fitting, right? Um, so first question is if a patient's having trouble seating a tray, what should the lab recommend to the doctor? Is it that they should try Chewies for a couple of days and see if it eventually seats or should the lab scrap it right away and start over? What would your suggestion be when you see that? Okay, so in, the, in that situation, we try not to throw out that series of aligners right off the bat. Uh, in a lot of these cases, the problem is there just isn't room for the teeth to move. And so sometimes, even if it's not called for by the prescription, we'll actually do a little bit of interproximal reduction and then hang in there with that aligner until we uh, get it retracking. Okay. Um, sometimes uh, if, if you see a tooth um, sort of intrude out of the blue sky, that's because there isn't room for it to move. And the only way it can go then is back into the gum. So definitely think of IPR and don't go to the next aligner until that's resolved. We are fans of Chewies, but we also are fans of Munchies as well. So it's kind of the, the next level. <laughs> of food. So we graduate people from Chewies to Munchies and Munchies are a little more sort of uh, uh, focused on a particular tooth. So almost always it's an upper lateral that just starts to misbehave. So uh, in that case, we'll localize it, make sure there's room with our IPR strips and then uh, have them work with the Munchie to get that uh, that aligner, the, the aligner, it's like a slippery watermelon seed. It's trying to catch that tooth and it, and it just can't. So we actually distort the aligner to get up there into the undercuts of the teeth and then uh, get okay. that tooth tracking again. Perfect. And if it's like tray number one, right? That you go to seat the first tray and it doesn't fit, would you kind of follow those same steps then versus a mid-course correction? 
Uh, check the name on the bag, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, that's good. Okay, that good starting place. <laughs> uh, gosh, you know, if it's if it's right from number one, assuming the scan was done recently or the impression was done recently and it's not in a individual whose teeth are still coming in and that sort of thing, something's up. Like either a, a, some sort of problem with the records that have been taken, either there something has changed since they were taken or they're distorted. Um, so in that case, I don't think, especially if there's like, <laughs> it looks like there's somebody else's aligners, uh, right. I would not try and force that because right away you're introducing frustration and, uh, and right th at that moment, the patient is still your best friend Yes, <laughs> and is willing to comply. But uh, if you force them into doing that sort of thing, it may not be so. So uh, reevaluate, have a good look at the, uh, at uh, what what the, what the scan looks like, uh, full contour will give you some feedback as well if they see distortions in the impression or the uh, scan and then uh, possibly sort of start again. Perfect, okay. And then um, when we're talking about full arch cases, right? Um, we put under setting expectations that refinements should be expected, right? So what percentage of cases would you expect to see a, ref uh, a refinement needed. Great, so Michelle, in almost all cases beyond about 10 or 12 aligners, uh, in my mind and in my P, <laughs> I, count <on, laughs> I count on at least one case refinement. And, and it has to do with, we are applying physics to biology and it, and it isn't always the same. Meaning that the computer has this great algorithm and it's amazing yeah. and fantastic, but you're also, taking that and putting it into a human being and it's not always as predictable and there's this there's this display away from the original uh scan that the computer can only guess so yes. much and so yes. uh we we tend to restrict the number of aligners in the initial uh series knowing that there would be at least one case refinement um uh, and kind of count on it from the practitioner standpoint in both our, when we're setting our expectations, as you talked about, uh, time-wise and fee-wise as well. Perfect. I love that. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, goes hand in hand with why we say, okay, let's look at those mild to moderate cases, because when you take on those complex cases, you're right that the algorithm or the software can only guess so much as to where is that tooth going to end up? What is that gingiva going to look like when we've made that much movement, right? And so then you end up, okay, well, we only got to tray 10 and now we got a scan and I already made 40 additional trays that all get thrown away, right? And so some aligner manufacturers have even moved to batch manufacturing where they only do six or 10 at a time, right? And if everything's tracking after those six or 10, great, we'll print the next six or 10. But um, people are getting really creative with trying to solve that problem because humans are not, we're not as predictable <laughs> as the software, right? <laughs> That's what makes it fun. Um, <laughs> and then uh, my last question for you was uh, trim lines. And, and so a lot of people who are in the laboratory space and they're trying to approach their doctors, they say, well, can you give me the Invisalign cut, right? Which is like the fully scalloped, or I think um, ClearCorrect does a, a straight cut, right? So there's all these different styles out there. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's your favorite style of trim line? Is there one that's better than the other? What is your opinion? Okay, so Michelle and Rob and I uh, went through this uh, painful process yes. <laughs> of figuring out what, <laughs> what's best. Um, and in my opinion, the reason why Invisalign has so many attachments is they have resisted going kind of beyond the gingival uh, margins with their scalloping. Uh, for one thing, it makes the manufacturing more, more compli complicated. For another thing, you can't get into the the, the serious handles that you can, if you extend a little further, uh, if you're just cutting to the gingival margins all the way along. So that means more attachments. So uh, then the other extreme is uh, the gingival zenus plus two millimeters. That starts to get into an area where they're irritating and causing speech problems as well, especially in the palate of the maxilla. So after lots and lots of tries and some errors, and I think at least one uh, bottle of, of whiskey as well, uh, <laughs> we, finally, we finally got to 
zenith plus one. And it gives us the sweet spot of enough plastic to get in and into the, the uh, undercuts of the teeth and have a great handle on each individual tooth, but not so overextended that they're irritating and causing speech problems. So the short answer is Zenith plus one. That's what we've come to. So we wanted to empower you guys when your labs say, well, I want the Invisalign, you know, fully scalloped. There's a reason, of, of course, Full Contour can do Yes. Uh, several different styles of trim lines. We can't do fully scalloped just due to patents and things, but we can do what we call like a, a rolling wave, um, but it doesn't get into the interproximal, the gingival interproximal. So um, we can kind of custom make your, your trim line, but what Dr. Bruce and I found is when you do kind of a more straight cut, one millimeter above the gingival margin, you're getting that great mechanical retention. You're not having to add additional attachments just for aligner retention. Um, and you get that great tooth movement, which is what we're all wanting. So um, let's see here. What is what is the tipping point that you would look for when you, when you should move a case out of just you know five to five movement to full arch movement? Oh, wow, great. So I think the answer is pretty well, any, anything that you see dist, distal to the fives uh, in, in any dimension, meaning that uh, rotated tooth, uh, you know, a space, uh, a buck, buccolingual uh, discrepancy, uh, almost always we're gonna wanna include posterior teeth in those. And also recognition that if you're dealing with like a really deep bite or a tough open bite, even though it seems like the movement's only going to be up front, Isaac Newton's going to be busy at the back as well. So we really want to um, uh, have that in our minds. So th the really short answer is almost all are, are going to include some posterior movement, if only to overcome the idea that you're headed towards a posterior open bite. Love and we it. do so by, through over engineering and full contour has figured that out. Yes, yes. Um, somebody asked, um, and this is more of a full contour question. I heard that there is a plan to integrate FC and TRIOS DD so that the design could be sent to the doc via communicate and they could look at the case and accept it via dental desktop. So um, three shape launched treatment review and we use treatment review with Argon clear aligners. So if you're in Argon laboratory, you have access to treatment review, which is a TRIOS and non-TRIOS doctors. So it could be an iTero doctor doctor, medit doctor, an impression taking doctor. Um, that is a, a very doctor facing portal that comes with a really nice 3D viewer and movement report. Today, that is only available if you're using Argon for manufacturing. However, Full Contour is working with ReShape to open that up to all uh, laboratories where you could use treatment review um, to accept clear liner cases from your doctors and then invite full contour into that case to do the design. And then you could do the manufacturing at your laboratory or pick a manufacturer to work with. So that is in the works. Um, and I think a lot of labs will really enjoy that because I think one of the um, weak areas is that doctors are really wanting that, that um, clean check look and feel, right? That's what they're used to. That's what they expect. And they want a portal that they can go to and see where's my patient at, what's going on with it. You know, they can easily pull up a patient if they're coming in for a checkup to look at the 3D viewer, look at the mouth and say, okay, yeah, patient's on track. Um, and uh, treatment review offers that. I mean, of course, Full Contour has the 3D viewer. We have the doctor approval app and those links don't expire. So doctor can always go back and pull that case up. But having a portal that the doctor can log into is a really nice feature. So we are working on that. How does Full Contour send design confirmation with three shape? Um, we have API connections to communicate. So basically, as soon as you would add Full Contour to that case, it via API is sent to the Full Contour portal. We do our thing same as normal. As soon as we upload that design via API, it's sent back to communicate and that design is shown to the doctor and to the laboratory. And they're fast. 72 hours or yeah, less? Yes, 72 hours or less. So uh, we try to do, do things really quickly. <laughs> um, any other questions? Oh, Rob says Dr. Bruce is my favorite. <laughs> He's my favorite. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so you guys don't forget to check the chat where there's the link to sign up for Dr. Bruce's training, the lab mm -hmm. 
education and doctor education. It's extremely valuable. Um, I think it'll really make your labs clear aligners stand apart from all the other offerings out there. If you have really strong education on why your aligners are awesome and why they work well. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining. This call will be recorded and we will send it out to everybody who registered. Oh, wait, we've got one more question. Retainers, what time frame do you recommend uh, for retainers? Um, for example, first month full time and then nightwear only after that? Or so basically, how, how long should they wear that final retainer for all the time? And then when can they switch to nighttime wear? Yeah, no, it's a great, a great question. question. We, we, uh, we, we generally go, yes, one month full time afterwards. And, uh, and then just nights after that, and we teach our patients to self monitor, meaning say they skip a few nights, they go on a trip, they forget their retainer, put it back in. And if it's really tight, then you got to recommit. And, and the beauty of these type of retainers are they, they remember, and they'll, they'll, you know, just by persevering, you can get those things to refit again. So, uh, and long-term that's our, that's our uh, strategy as well. Hold on to these things long-term, put them in. Um, if they're really tight, wear them more often. If they're not, then you just know your teeth aren't moving. And we sell that to the patient by saying, hey, we know people's teeth drift throughout life, even if they haven't had orthodontics. Yes. So this is, this is what it is. And by the way, in the meantime, that retainer will act as a clenching guard at night. And uh, hit us up for some tooth whitener as well. Oh, add-ons. I love it. Right? <laughs> <There> you <go. laughs> actually, you know what? That actually brought up a good question um, that I thought of earlier. I forgot to ask you. So we, we you just mentioned teeth move, right? Um, and so say a lab gets a scan and doctor goes on vacation and a month or two goes by and then the doc's like, oh, I need to get this treatment plan done, right? At what time frame would you recommend nah, the patient needs to get rescanned? How long okay. is too long? Another great, another great question. Where are, our limit is at about three months, Michelle, in a fully grown kind of non-changing uh, 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 individual. Definitely shorter if it's kid that's getting new teeth yeah. all the time or losing baby teeth and that sort of thing. So I would say if the scan or impression is within the past three months, we're still pretty safe. Uh, if it's if it's a refinement, it's got to be sooner because in that three months, if the patient isn't wearing their uh, aligners, things are going to fall back. Yeah. Definitely. I've had physical braces twice and my teeth have moved and I even have a permanent retainer in there. I'm like, what is this? Okay, so, so. I'm on my way to Glendale. Please, <laughs> please, please help me. I'm a mess. Um, so Felix asked, uh, will we be able to control the design for small final changes like ClinCheck Pro? So uh, at this time, we don't have um, any development planned uh, for that uh, ability. Um, we would love that. It is very challenging to build. <laughs> development for that. So uh, Felix, not in the next six months, it won't be available. But of course, we would love to move in that direction if that's possible. I just don't don't have the answer today for that. In the meantime, my experience has been just words. Uh, um, they're full of contours texts are so great. Like they, they absolutely understand uh, and will give you uh, exactly what you probably would have come up with through um, your own controls. So just don't hesitate to communicate with them and uh, just know that they have uh, in their hearts, they really, really want to help you out and make you successful. Yeah, and redesigns are done within 24 to 48 hours max. So we do a quick turnaround time on those. Um, and if there was a redesign that came back where you're still not happy, we 100% can always get you on a Zoom meeting like this with a, a technician who's designing the case so we can make sure that we get you a really good outcome. So no worries there. Okay, I think that's it. You guys had some good questions. This has been a lot of fun. I love these webinars. It's so educational. Thank you, Dr. Bruce, for your time. And again, we will email this out to everybody. Have a wonderful evening. We'll talk to you guys later. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye.